Are you tired of paying more and more taxes for governments that rescue banks but milk the average citizen? Governments that are like puppets for whoever has the most money? If so, this is the talk you've been waiting for. What I'm about to describe will not only lower taxes, it will eliminate political corruption and put authentic leaders into power. If this sounds like a pipe dream, give me a few minutes and an open mind. If I'm right, lower taxes and authentic leadership is just part of a human story with a very happy ending. Let's start with a little imagination. Imagine that your life is a fishing trip. And imagine that everything you own is a fish. Your car, your house, your bank accounts, your business. These are all things that you have caught from the ocean of life. Now imagine that you have to gather all of your things for a proud Facebook picture like this one. Please take a moment to gather all of your fish now. Okay, without feeling any pressure, how much of your fish are you willing to contribute to the common good? Zero percent? Ten percent? Fifty percent? Any amount is fine. Just be honest with yourself. And when you have your number, make a mental note of it. And with your number in mind, let's talk about politicians. In your opinion, are today's politicians more selfish or giving when it comes to their fish? Most people we survey in country after country around the world believe that politicians are much more selfish than giving. This is a problem. It's a big problem. In fact, it's the central problem on which every other major human problem is hinged. That's worth repeating. Self-interest in politics is humanity's biggest problem. If we could fix this, would you be interested? Of course you would. That's why you're part of TED. The question is how. How do we get the right people into government and keep the wrong people away? This question has dominated the Western intellectual tradition for 2,500 years, and it's kept me awake at night for almost four decades. In the next 15 minutes, we're going to answer this question once and for all. First, let's analyze our fishing trip. In it, there are two forces at play. The first force is property. If we plot property on a line, we can visualize what we all know to be true. Some people have a lot of it, others less. The second force is charity, and the same principle applies. Some people are very charitable, others less. If we juxtapose these two forces by placing property on the x-axis and charity on the y, we have the start of an interesting analysis. In fact, if we take it one step further, we can chart a great big chunk of political and economic history onto one graph with four quadrants. Each of these quadrants corresponds to a different amount of property and charity. Using this graph, take a moment to find where you are now and where you would like to be in the future. As we all know, when it comes to politics, people inevitably divide into two camps, left and right. The left camp corresponds to the collectivist quadrant in the upper left. The right corresponds to the individual quadrant in the lower right. This left-right tension is not trivial or coincidental. It precedes politics by hundreds of thousands of years and goes to the very core of our animal and rational nature. Nothing that we've ever done or conceived of in the past has been able to reconcile these two conflicting forces. They're like oil and water in the human soul. What's especially troubling at this point in history is that this antagonism persists across countries, cultures, and continents. What humanity desperately needs is a way to transfer this left-right political tension up into the fourth quadrant, which is neither right nor left. It's both and neither. This quadrant is ideal because it brings together powerful economies with a high level of commitment to the common good. The question is, how do we get there? 
The only viable option, of course, is democracy. But our current democracy has proven itself incapable of getting us there. According to our vision, this is because the model is seriously flawed. The flaw in our current democracy is that in it, all hearts are equal. By that I mean that no matter how much I contribute to the common good, I'm politically equal to everybody else, even if they contribute little or nothing. This flaw is comparable to the flaw in communism, where economies rot because people don't have the incentive to be creative. In democracy, this lack of incentive to work for the common good creates an equally rotten opposite extreme where self-interest pigs out on the common good. Don't get me wrong, there's nothing wrong with self-interest. It's an integral part of human nature, and it's great for the economy, but it doesn't belong in politics. This is a picture of my father, three of my sisters, and myself. Uh, not too long after this picture was taken, my father introduced me to the problem of politics, and the chip has been with me ever since. My mission in life, the reason I was born, is to convince you that we can fix politics. We can fix politics and make the world a better place for everybody, rich, poor, and middle class, with a relatively small tweak, important tweak, in our current model of democracy. Just as the carrot of capitalism is individual economic gain, Democracy is missing a carrot for individual political gain. Without this carrot, we're working with a sort of communist zombie democracy where somebody who gives everything is equal to somebody who gives nothing. And this imbalance will never function properly. So the solution in three steps. First, instead of only one vote, people should have the ability to obtain more votes in proportion to their charity. Second, we can measure charity by counting the fish that a person brings to the common table. And third, since fish are not easy to carry around, we propose voluntary taxes as a more practical way of measuring charity. The incentive we are proposing then for democracy is additional votes in exchange for higher voluntary taxes. In a minute, you'll see the absolutely tectonic effect that this will have on our social, economic, and political systems. Now, I know this is all very shocking, so I'd like to take a couple of steps back and ease you out of your shock by reviewing three basic premises on which our model is based. The first premise is that democracy has not finished evolving. In the first democracy, voting rights were limited to a defined group of men. Since then, democracy has evolved to include everybody. This gives the impression that we've reached a limit, that there's no more evolving to do. In reality, democracy is part of a much larger evolutionary process that started billions of years ago and will continue for many more. To insist that our current model of democracy represents the absolute crowning achievement of human statecraft and that it will never get any better is fitting only for the mind of a drunken Neanderthal. That's our first premise. Our second premise is that human hearts are not equal. People are equal in freedom, human rights, dignity, and many other important ways. But when it comes to charity, we certainly aren't equal. We're all familiar with Gauss's bell curve. In politics, we are foolish to ignore the bell curve of human hearts. That's our second premise. A third premise is that competition produces elites. This is a mathematical law that's built into the very nature of the universe, and it applies to every area of human activity. In business, for example, perfect competition favors the most innovative and efficient companies. In the Olympics, likewise, competition produces world-class athletes. If we incentivize competition for the common good, we can count on the rise of a similar elite group of competitors. So let's review. Democracy is not finished evolving. Human hearts are not equal. 
and competition produces elites. The voluntary tax proposal stems logically from these three premises. If we want to fix politics, we believe that we must allow democracy to evolve. Embrace the unequal human heart and enable an elite group of politicians to arise through voluntary taxes. At the heart of our proposal is a very individualistic incentive, the incentive that's missing from our current democracy, an incentive that says, if you give more, you get more. And this incentive is founded on the principle that true power, lasting power, the kind that transcends space and time, comes from service. When you combine these abstract principles and bring them into the world of politics, you get the voluntary tax formula. This formula can incorporate a wide array of macro and microeconomic factors, but the essence will always be very simple. The more you give and the longer you give, the more votes you get. The result of competing for power along these lines is that just as in capitalism, bigger fish eat smaller fish and we get better products and services for lower prices, so in politics, bigger hearts engulf smaller hearts and we get better politicians and lower taxes. This upward pressure for bigger fish and bigger hearts will lead the planet inevitably into the right corner exactly where we want to be beyond petty partisan politics and divisive political ideologies into thriving economies that work for the common good. If you followed me so far, what you should see is a very healthy balance between the self-interest of capitalism and a new, more highly evolved model of democracy, all founded on a very firm foundation of individual freedom. So what if you don't want to pay voluntary taxes? I think this is one of the strengths of the model. It's built on the dignity and freedom of every person. In our uh, model, politicians will be highly competitive individuals who have taxed themselves at the highest rates for the longest times. These individuals will not be bought by corporations, nor will they be envious of your wealth or anxious to redistribute it, either to banks or to poor people. It's your money. By the same token, if you're poor, you'll know that politicians are working hard, using their own money to create employment and or volunteer opportunities for you. Our proposal is fundamentally sound because it encompasses the whole human person, the individual side and the collective side. It's so firmly rooted in this human wholeness that there are no valid objections from anybody, anywhere, at any point on the political spectrum. Let's review some of the more common objections. The first and most common is that the rich will have an unfair advantage. This isn't so because voluntary taxes are measured proportionally and annually. At the upper extreme, individuals will be competing at annual tax rates of 100%. You don't have to be a finance expert to understand that rich people will not find this very attractive. A second objection says that corruption is unavoidable. So let's walk through an example. As a young person, you feel called as a vocation to a life of politics. You turn 18, you give your inheritance away. You then get a job, you give 90% of your first paycheck in voluntary taxes. The second month, you do the same thing. You repeat this process for 70 years. What can somebody possibly offer you as a bribe? And even if you accept, what are they going to offer the millions of others just like you in the top tier of politics? A third common objection says that voluntary taxes will never be enough to finance government. In the short term, the competition is much more important than the revenue. At the givingpledge.org, for example, Warren Buffett and Bill Gates challenge their fellow billionaires to pledge the majority of their wealth to philanthropy. Most billionaires ignore the pledge. Our model would grant the individuals on the list additional votes in proportion to their giving. This additional power would put pressure on public policy to align business goals with social models. 
Bill Gates calls this creative capitalism. In the long run, this competitive, socially sustainable cycle of addressing society's needs with business models will inevitably shrink the size of government, boost the economy until politics can be financed 100% by voluntary taxes. A fourth common objection says that self-interest has historically been much more successful than self-sacrifice in the management of human affairs. It's important to understand that our model doesn't aim to eliminate self-interest. In fact, it celebrates self-interest and defends it as the motor of robust market economies. In fact, the voluntary tax model is the only theoretical framework on the planet capable of reconciling the extremes of individualism and the extremes of collectivism into one holistic, integrated system. A fifth objection, my personal favorite, says that our current politicians will never let such a system come into being. The truth is, they have no choice. Human progress has always been, first and foremost, a war of ideas. Trying to argue against voluntary taxes is like bringing a knife to a nuclear war. And trying to stop voluntary taxes is like trying to stop the sun from rising. Ladies and gentlemen, we've reached a critical juncture in our evolution as a species. Our current political systems are incapable of responding to the profound complexities of globalization, not to mention the deeper questions of existence with the best interests of everybody in mind and certainly not thinking about the weakest and most vulnerable among us. The voluntary tax model responds to this predicament by inviting, but not forcing, men and women, rich and poor, from all walks of life and from every corner of the planet to compete for political power by working for the common good. In return for the sacrifice, the model grants the most competitive among us the right to lead our cities and nations with the political authority that victory over self-interest deserves. This is no pipe dream. Our proposal is concrete, doable, compelling, and universal. It seems fitting, then, to come full circle and close with our opening question. How do we get the right people into government and keep the wrong people away? Today, we have the answer. Thank you very much.